Well, and a happy Saturday morning to you viewers and subscribers. Russ Barkley here with your weekend research update. As always, we're going to start with a couple of really bad dad jokes because I just think they're funny. So this one is coming to us from the website of the Company of Dads. Uh, and here's a few for you. I, I kind of like this one. I, I'm reading a horror story in Braille. Something bad is going to happen. I can just feel it. <laughs> clever, go clever boy, that one. Excuse me. Okay, here's one. What has five toes but isn't your foot? My foot. <laughs> now you know what they're dad jokes. Okay, last one up is what's blue and not very heavy? Obviously, light blue. Okay, <laughs> let's get on with this now. All right, that done and out of the way. We've got four articles to talk about that were published this week that I thought were uh, worthy of comment. Obviously, that's why I'm going to talk about it. Once again, the hot links to these articles are over in the description that comes with this video. Uh, the first up is a, a very nice paper, very large study uh, that is looking at the role of circadian rhythm and sleep disruption and efficiencies in both autism spectrum and ADHD. Now, you know, earlier in this week on Tuesday, I dropped a video that was dealing with the role of sleeping difficulties, particularly sleep apnea in ADHD, and also talked about the evidence for surgical interventions helping some of the children with sleep apnea in improving their inattention symptoms. So have a look at that video if you're interested more in that. This is really looking at the role of circadian rhythm versus disruptions in sleep in autism and ADHD. And it's also looking at the genetic contributions to these difficulties in both disorders. The study involved more than 450,000 individuals uh, who had data in the data banks for these genetic studies. And what they found, just to cut through a very complex methodology here, is that both ADHD and autism spectrum had different diurnal rhythms, that is circadian rhythms throughout the day, than typically developing individuals. We've known for a long time that specifically ADHD individuals appear to have a delay in their peak time of their circadian rhythm, that is the peak time for their attention, arousal, alertness, and so on, seems to be delayed several hours into the day than compared to the typically developing individuals who have their higher levels of alertness arousal activity earlier in their circadian rhythm, in their diurnal rhythm. So very interesting that this very large study finds that to be the case for both ASD and ADHD. Now, they did find that independent of those circadian rhythm differences, Autism spectrum disorder was associated much more with inefficient and insufficient sleep. So they weren't getting as, as much sleep and it wasn't particularly efficient. Whereas ADHD was much more likely to be associated with disrupted sleep episodes. So the two neurodevelopmental disorders appear to have some different correlates when it comes to the impairments they experience in sleep. And that's in addition to these delays in their circadian rhythm. So I just thought you might want to know about that study. It was published over in the journal Autism. Uh, and I thought it was a very nice study done out of China. Okay, next up is a study that is a multinational study involving scientists in both Canada and the US. Uh, it's part of what is called the ABCD study. It's a longitudinal study of a very large population of individuals through their adolescent years that's looking uh, at various neuroimaging measures, including white matter microstructure, and it is evaluating these brain-related changes 
as a function of disorders and other measures that they're taking, psychological, diagnostic, psychiatric measures, and their relationship to these brain-related developmental changes. So very big study known as the Adolescent Brain Cognition Development Study, ABCD. In this particular paper, the authors of this multi-site study are comparing 673 children with disruptive behavior disorders, that includes ADHD, oppositional disorder, conduct disorder, and 836 typically developing children. Uh, they were at the time of their initial assessment, ages nine to 10. And the authors were specifically evaluating the white matter microstructure. So not the gray matter on the outside surface of the brain, the cortex, but the white matter, which are the fiber bundles that connect various regions of the brain and are known to be subcortical below the cortex. So they're sort of the fiber bundles that are communicating around the brain. So what did they find? They looked at 13 different white matter microstructure bundles, and they found that individuals with disruptive behavior disorders had greater disturbances in these bundles, in their microstructure, than did typically developing individuals. Uh, by the way, that's not new. That finding has been seen going back more than a decade now uh, in terms of repeatedly finding in studies of white matter disruptions in the white matter. This study found that there were some that were sex specific, occurring more in boys uh, than in girls and vice versa. That's not important to our findings here. But what they did find is that ADHD was associated with disturbances in these structures. More importantly, this study was also looking at traumatic brain injuries that had been experienced by the children in this study. And here's what they found. Kids with ADHD specifically, but in general, kids with any of the disruptive behavior disorders were much more likely to have experienced a traumatic brain injury, both the boys and the girls. Although it was found that the boys were slightly more likely to have such experiences, it was both sexes that were likely to experience these TBIs. Now, they found that in the children who already had a disruptive behavior disorder like ADHD, that if they had had a TBI in addition to that, there was even greater disruption in their white matter microstructure, suggesting that the TBI worsens the underlying brain pathology and thereby worsens the ADHD or disruptive behavior disorders and probably worsens their outcomes as well. So uh, a very nice study, study on differences between kids with ADHD and typical kids in their white matter microstructure and the impact, so to speak, that traumatic brain injuries has on these underlying white matter disruptions. All right, let's go on and take a look at another study. Uh, this one was published over in the journal Behavioral Sciences, and it's a meta-analysis, and you know I like meta-analyses, uh, and it's comparing two different kinds of physical exercise and the value that is the improvements they might make in the executive functioning of individuals, particularly those with ADHD. Now, we know, as I've talked about repeatedly on this channel, that physical activity and especially routine physical exercise does appear to be of somewhat greater benefit than no exercise in helping individuals to cope with their ADHD. So uh, this study wasn't trying to investigate that issue specifically. It was concerned with the kind of exercise. Were these closed environment, closed environment exercises that were done indoors, that were kind of repetitive, that didn't involve a lot, an awful lot of novelty, an awful lot of adaptive uh, adjustments to the environment. Uh, basically the kind of thing you might see when you're working out indoors, such as in a dance class that you might be taking or in lifting weights. You're going through these very, uh, these skilled exercise movements, but they're repetitive. There's not an awful lot 
of thinking and adapting to the environment that has to go on here. And then they compared that to studies of open skill exercises that were done out of doors in which the individuals had to be continually adjusting to the environment. Think about long distance running, think about games like soccer or lacrosse and so on, where the individual is not only exercising, but there's a great deal of problem solving, uh, body readjustment, changes in motor skills and performance that are going on throughout the activity. The study found that in their meta-analysis, both forms of exercise were beneficial to improving the executive functioning of the individuals in the study. But they found that that done as an open skill out of door exercise appeared to be even significantly more beneficial than the closed environment, closed skill exercises that the individuals might have been doing. So exercise helps. Any kind of exercise seems to do pretty well, but doing exercise out of doors that requires a lot of adaptation to the environment, a lot of change that one has to think about problem solves and adapt one's exercise and motor patterns to might be even more beneficial. So uh, a very nice meta-analysis out of China there. Finally, we're gonna wrap up this weekend's research review with a meta-analysis that was done to correct for an earlier meta-analysis I reported a couple of months ago, and that was uh, the prevalence of ADHD in the prison population. As you may recall, the initial meta-analysis reported a relatively low prevalence rate of about 8%. As I told you then, I found that rather surprising because most of the studies, individual studies that I've had a chance to see were finding figures up around 18 to 25% or higher of ADHD in the prison population. Well, these authors of this reanalysis went back, took the same studies, same measures, combined the data, but analyzed it differently correcting for what they thought were the flaws in the analyses done in the earlier paper, and they come up with a figure of 22%, much closer to what I certainly thought it might be given earlier studies. And they say that this disagrees with the earlier review uh, and that it may have to do with the factors I just mentioned, that is improper analyses and being very restrictive in their inclusion and exclusion criteria for what studies got into the meta-analysis. So, okay, there you have it, folks. I hope you enjoyed this weekend's research review. Uh, as always, if you're not a subscriber, please sign up. Uh, and if you are, thank you. As you know, we celebrated last week crossing the 100,000 subscriber mark, and I was really deeply appreciative of everyone's support in getting us to that milestone. So, uh, as always, I'm going to sign off by telling you to live well and be well. Thanks for joining me, everybody. Take care.